In less than two weeks, a total solar eclipse will cut a path across 13 states, darkening parts of the country for several minutes as the moon passes between the sun and earth. Mark your calendars for an extraordinary event. On April 8, 2024, darkness will descend in broad daylight as the moon passes between earth and the sun, creating a total solar eclipse visible across America. It's a moment that intertwines with the fabric of American politics and stirs up talks of prophecies. As the day approaches, let's find out and uncover the secrets behind this celestial phenomenon and its prophetic ties to our times. The sun will move north across the equator, which marks the beginning of spring. It's the earliest start to spring in 128 years. That's since way back in 1896. But wait, there's more to come. On April 8th, get ready for a total solar eclipse. It's like a magic show in the sky. During this eclipse, the moon will cover the sun completely, making it dark in the middle of the day. People along a narrow path will experience this amazing darkness. Even if you're not on the path, you can still join the fun. Just grab some eclipse glasses and you'll see the moon passing in front of the sun. It's like watching a fantastic puzzle unfold in the sky. This eclipse will be visible from Mexico all the way to Canada, passing through 14 U.S. states. And get this, it's the first time since 1979 that folks in the southern part of Canada will see it directly. A total solar eclipse is like a celestial game of hide-and-seek. It happens when the moon slides perfectly between the sun and the earth, creating a shadow on our planet. If you're lucky enough to stand under that shadow, you'll see something incredible. The sun's rays will disappear for a few minutes, and you'll feel like you're in the middle of the night, even if it's daytime. But why does it matter where you stand? Well, the start time, end time, and how much of the sun gets covered by the moon depend on where you are. So, it's a bit like a cosmic tailor-made experience. Now, let's talk about other eclipses. There's the annular eclipse where the moon covers the sun but leaves a ring around it. It's like a shy sun peeking through a curtain. And then there's the lunar eclipse where the moon turns red. It's like a cosmic paintbrush dipped in crimson. But some people see these events differently. They believe eclipses are messages from a higher power. In ancient times, solar eclipses were seen as bad omens. They made the day feel eerie, animals act strange, and plants react differently. And here's where it gets really interesting. Some folks think these eclipses are signs from God. They point to ancient texts that talk about the sun turning dark and the moon turning red. It's like a cosmic code sent from above. So, whether you see it as a scientific marvel or a divine message, a solar eclipse is a sight to behold. Divine Signs in the Sky Solar eclipses have always captured human imagination. They occur when the moon moves between the sun and earth, casting a shadow on earth and fully or partially blocking the sun's light in some areas. These events are more than just stunning visual spectacles. They have deep cultural significance and have been interpreted in various ways throughout history. In the Bible, solar eclipses are often seen as powerful signs from God. Genesis 1.14, for example, mentions celestial bodies as signs to mark sacred times. Many people believe that these events are messages from a higher power, meant to signal important events or changes. The rarity of total solar eclipses adds to their mystique. While they happen somewhere on Earth about every 18 months, they occur at any given location only once every few hundred years on average. This infrequency makes each eclipse that occurs in one's lifetime a special event. Biblical accounts like Exodus 10, 21, 23 describe solar eclipses as profound occurrences. The passage tells of a darkness so deep it could be felt, a darkness that lasted three days and was a demonstration of divine power. Similarly, Joshua 10, 12, 13 recounts a day when the sun stood still in the sky, extending the day so the Israelites could win a crucial battle. This event is sometimes interpreted as a solar eclipse, though it's described as an extended day rather than a period of darkness. The New Testament also references a darkness during the crucifixion of Jesus, 
as noted in Mark 15.32-33. From the sixth to the ninth hour, darkness fell over the land, which some interpret as a solar eclipse, though this would be an unusual one if it lasted three hours. Revelation 6.12 speaks of a time when the sun turns black and the moon turns blood red. This imagery is echoed in other parts of the Bible, like Matthew 24, 29, where celestial darkness follows tribulation. For many Christians, these passages suggest that solar eclipses are significant omens. The sun and moon are seen as representing different entities, the sun as the nations of the world and the moon as the nation of Israel. The lunar calendar, which governs religious observances in Judaism, is based on the moon's cycles, while most of the world follows the solar calendar for secular matters. The Bible tells us that Jesus spoke of signs in the sun, moon, and stars before his return. This makes some believe that a solar eclipse is a warning from God. If you think this is true, it is time to leave your sins behind and prepare for the Lord's coming. God's warning to America requires us to look back. We need to examine the Bible where previous signs have occurred. After examining everything, we can step back and see if a warning sign is happening or if there is a connection to Bible prophecy that may be happening. The Bible in Ecclesiastes 1.9 tells us, What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. This means history repeats itself. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He never changes. This means that God still speaks as he always has and he always deals with sin and nations as he always has. There are patterns in history and in the Bible that have repeated themselves concerning the state of nations idolatry and sin that God has dealt with. There were signs that occurred. Every major prophet in the Bible who spoke about Israel's idolatry and sin was accompanied by specific signs and warnings of what was to come. In Revelation chapter 6, we see the four horsemen of the apocalypse dealing with God's judgment of the nations. They are a division of a conqueror or world leader of some sort that leads a global conquest followed by W.O.R. division and civil unrest, the power to take peace from the earth. Then there is famine, economic hardship, harvests are impacted and economies are wiped out, followed by death, plague, illness, pestilence, and disease. Although we see this happening on a global scale, these four signs have happened repeatedly throughout the Bible and in history concerning God dealing with the sins and idolatries of a nation. For example, God raised up the Babylonian conqueror Nebuchadnezzar to carry out judgment not just against Israel, but all the surrounding nations including Egypt, Assyria, and Moab, even against the Philistines and the Phoenicians who lived in the area known today as the Gaza Strip. Just before the sieges, according to the prophet Jeremiah, there was also a severe plague and famine in the area that had been ravaging the land for several years, which weakened the nations in preparation for Babylon. Jeremiah 38.2 says, Thus says, The Lord, he who remains in this city, shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes over to the Chaldeans shall live. His life shall be as a prize to him, and he shall live. If you look at what's happened recently, beginning in 2020, we had all four signs present over not just America, but the world of plague famine, economic hardships, and major civil unrest concerning the riots and protests that followed. Lastly, with WR dealing with Russia. But still, what about the moments that history overlooks? The division of a nation, the rise and fall of kingdoms, and the prophecies that echo through time. Subscribe to the channel right now and keep watching till the end. In the grand design of our world, many believe that every element has a purpose. The sun and the moon are no exception. They are not just celestial bodies that provide light. They are also seen as symbols. For instance, in the context of biblical prophecy, the moon is often associated with Israel, while the sun is linked to Gentile nations. The creation story, as told in Genesis, presents an interesting sequence. Plants, which we know need sunlight and rain to thrive, were created on the third day. 
Yet, the sun and the moon made their appearance on the fourth day. This raises a curious question. How could vegetation grow without the sun or rain? According to Genesis 2, 5, 6, before the flood, rain was not a part of the world's natural processes. Instead, streams rose from the earth and watered the ground. This suggests that the early world operated differently from what we know today. The purpose of the sun and the moon extends beyond their physical functions. Genesis 1, 14, 19 describes them as markers for sacred times, days, and years. They serve as signs, not just sources of light. This interpretation opens up a broader perspective on the role of these celestial bodies in the spiritual and physical realms. Reflecting on these ideas, it's clear that the sun and the moon hold significant places in both the physical world and the realm of symbolism. Their creation and the timing of it, according to the scriptures, point to a deeper meaning, one that goes beyond the mere existence of light and touches on the divine plan for the universe. In the beginning, there was light and darkness. The light was given two great guardians, the sun to rule the day and the moon to guide the night. Stars were scattered across the sky like diamonds on a vast black velvet cloth. This celestial arrangement was set to light up the earth, to distinguish day from night, and to serve as markers for time and seasons. On the fourth day, these lights in the sky took on a role beyond mere illumination. They became signs for special days and years, for feasts and holy gatherings. The Bible, in Joel 2, 30, 31, speaks of a time when extraordinary events in the heavens and on earth will signal the approach of a significant moment, the day of the Lord. It talks of a sun shrouded in darkness and a moon glowing red like blood, heralding a time of great change. These signs are not just natural phenomena, they carry deeper meanings. A red moon, for instance, is often seen as a harbinger of war and conflict, a time when blood is shed. Fire and smoke, too, are symbols. They speak of volcanic eruptions and earthquakes, nature's powerful forces unleashed. The years 2014 and 2015 witnessed a rare sequence of lunar eclipses that coincided with Jewish festivals. These were called the Blood Moon Tetrads, each of these four blood moons fell on significant dates, aligning with Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles twice in a row. This sequence of celestial events was so rare that it had only happened a handful of times in the last 2,000 years. The number four carries its own weight in this context. It represents the Word of God reaching all corners of the earth. The moon stands as a guardian over Israel, a symbol of divine protection. And the deep red of the lunar eclipse? It's a stark reminder of the judgment to come, a visual representation of prophecy and warning. In simple terms, the number two is often linked to the idea of division or separation. This concept is highlighted in the Bible, where a pair of eclipses over two years is seen as a sign of warning. It's like a big red flag, saying, pay attention to the division of Israel's land. The Bible, in Joel 3, 1, 2, talks about a time when God will bring back the good times to Judah and Jerusalem. It's like a big family reunion where everyone comes back home. But there's a twist. God will also call all the nations to a place called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. It's not for a party, though. It's more like a court session where these nations have to answer for splitting up Israel's land and scattering its people. The story gets more interesting as the Bible points fingers at specific places. Tyre and Sidon, along with the regions of Philistia, are named as the main troublemakers. Philistia is where the Gaza Strip is today, and the people there are now known as Palestinians. The term Palestine has a bit of a history. It was coined by the Romans who, after destroying the Second Temple in Jerusalem, decided to rename Israel after the Philistines. It was their way of making fun of God and the Israelites. Fast forward to today, and the Palestinians are central to the talks about a two-state solution with Israel. The Bible also talks about a future leader, the Antichrist, who will make a seven-year peace deal. This isn't just any deal. 
It's one that involves the whole world and, specifically, Israel's land. Tyre and Sidon were once home to the Phoenicians, known for their trading skills. They're mentioned in the Bible, too, in Ezekiel 28, which talks about the king of Tyre as a preview of the Antichrist. After the Greeks and Romans took over Tyre and Sidon, the Phoenicians moved to Greece and Rome. They even left their mark on the name of a whole continent. Europe was named after Europa, the daughter of a Phoenician king. So, what does this all mean for us today? Well, the EU, UN, and even America can trace some of their roots back to Tyre and Sidon, and these are the places that will play a role in the peace treaty that the Antichrist will confirm. Seven years after the first eclipse in August 2017, another one will happen. This one will create a big X across the United States. But unlike the last time, this eclipse will only cover the eastern half of the country. And it's happening seven months before the presidential elections, not after in the history of Israel. A significant event often overlooked is the division into two kingdoms, Israel and Judah. This split marked a pivotal moment as both kingdoms pursued different paths. Israel established a new capital and place of worship, which was seen as a deviation from divine laws. Consequently, they faced the wrath of the Assyrian king, an event interpreted as a divine judgment for their actions. The dispersion of the ten tribes of Israel was a moment of turning away, a divine face turned from the people. Judah, despite witnessing Israel's fate, fell into similar transgressions and faced captivity. However, their return and the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple were seen as necessary for the fulfillment of a divine promise, the coming of a Messiah from the line of Judah. Yet, the rejection and death of the Messiah led to another dispersion by Rome. The story then shifts to a promise of restoration, a divine call back to the promised land, which aligns with historical events like the Balfour Declaration Post World WRI. This return is seen as a fulfillment of a divine promise of love and redemption. The concept of cosmic disturbances as signs, particularly the blood moon, is also significant in this context. Blood moons, or lunar eclipses, are seen as omens of divine judgment, especially for Israel. The occurrence of a blood moon tetrad, four consecutive lunar eclipses without partial eclipses in between, on specific Jewish festivals, is highlighted as a warning for Israel. Since the time of Jesus, such tetrads have occurred eight times, each coinciding with critical moments for the nation. This interpretation of history and cosmic events is woven into the belief system surrounding the end times and the anticipated Gog and Magog war. It suggests a period of peace in Israel before such a war, a time when the nation lives without fear of invasion or need for defenses. This peace is seen as a precursor to the prophesied conflict, a calm before the storm. In the years 1493 to 1494, something extraordinary happened in the sky. A tetrad of lunar eclipses took place. This event was remarkable because it followed a significant moment in history. In 1492, King Ferdinand of Spain made a big decision. He ordered that all Jewish people must leave his country. This was a tough time for many. Among those who left Spain was Christopher Columbus. He was on a mission to find a new place for his people to live. His journey led to the discovery of America. Fast forward to the years 1949 to 1950, and the skies tell another story. Another tetrad of lunar eclipses graced the heavens. This time it was after a momentous event for the nation of Israel. In 1948, Israel declared itself an independent state. This was a big deal because it was the first time Israel was its own country since it was destroyed in the year 70. Then in 1967 to 1968, another tetrad followed the Six-Day War. This war was a big win for Israel. For the first time in 2,000 years, Jerusalem became the capital of Israel again. The eighth tetrad happened in 2014 to 2015. This one was unique because it had a solar eclipse right in the middle. A solar eclipse is often seen as a warning sign. Some people think it means that WR might be coming. Around the same time, Donald Trump was getting ready to become president. 
He started his campaign in 2015 and was elected in 2016. A few years later, in 2020, something called the Abraham Accords was signed. This was a big step for peace. Until next time, keep looking up, because the end is not the end. It's just the beginning of a new adventure.